Now, we often hear terms like IPS LCD, terms like OLED, thrown around in association with screens and monitors. But what do these terms actually mean? What are the underlying technologies behind all these complex sounding terms? Well, today we're going to take a look at just a small number of these display technologies to try and better understand how they work. You're watching another Random Wednesday episode on 0612 TV. Hello and welcome to another Random Wednesday episode. Today, we're going to be taking a look at five different display technologies. What we'll do is we'll try to understand, you know, how they actually work, and we'll try to talk about something special about each one of them. We're going to start with the more historical of the display technologies, and we'll sort of work our way forward towards the future. So without further ado, let's jump into our very first display technology. First and foremost, we have cathode ray tubes, CRTs. You know those, those very huge monitors with that tube at the back. CRTs are made up of two key components, one or more electron guns at the back, as well as a phosphorescent screen in front. Here's how it works. The way a CRT works is relatively simple. The electron gun actually fires an electron forwards towards the screen. The electron actually passes through a set of magnets, and these magnets can actually deflect the particle so that it can hit different positions on the screen. By varying the magnetic field, you can actually cause the stream of electrons to scan the entire screen, thus drawing your image. To draw out a color image, basically multiple electron guns are used at slightly offset positions. Thanks to the fact that they are at somewhat offset positions, these electrons actually hit the screen at slightly different angles. In order to have each one of these electrons hit their respective color, a mask is actually present to block off electrons coming in from the wrong angle. This actually allows you to pick and choose which electron corresponds to which color and that is how you actually draw out a color image. Here's something special about CRTs. Since electrons are actually deflected by a magnetic field, well, you can actually cause a CRT to behave erratically if you were to actually change or add to that field. In fact, to do this, you just need to hold a reasonably strong magnet up to the front or the sides of a CRT TV, and you'll actually cause the colors to go all weird. What's even worse is if you actually have a magnet that is reasonably strong or you know you hold it up long enough, you could actually end up magnetizing areas inside of the screen. And that of course creates a permanent magnetic field that deflects all the electrons the wrong way. What that means is you could end up with weird splotches of color even if you actually you know bring that magnet somewhere else. This is why some computer monitors actually have a degauss option the whole idea is, well, when you actually you know, select the degauss option, it tries to wipe out any lingering magnetic fields to fix this problem. Let's move on to our second of somewhat historical display technologies. This is called DLP, also known as Digital Light Processing. Now, this one is very interesting. It tends to be used in projection systems the most. Basically, you have a chip and the chip actually controls an array of micro mirrors. You have a separate light source and what happens is the chip can actually sort of move the mirrors to reflect the light from the light source out towards a lens or back into the body of the projector itself onto a heat sink. As you can imagine, this mechanism is how individual pixels are actually switched on or off. Here's something special about DLP. There are actually some very interesting caveats as to how it actually works. As you can imagine, well, the light source is at one intensity, so if you actually want to show a pixel with, you know, sort of a middle ground intensity, what happens is the mirrors are actually toggled back and forth very quickly. The time in which it is actually reflecting light versus the time in which it is not is how you actually create different intensities of brightness. In addition, this system also doesn't actually display color. In order for it to properly display color, the easiest way is to use a color wheel, and that basically filters the color of the light. 
So as you can imagine, what is happening is the color wheel will rotate to say red, and well, the DLP chip itself basically reflects light in the red channel. Then we switch very quickly to green, you know, both in terms of the color wheel as well as the image that is displayed by the DLP chip, and once again for blue. So in fact, the red, green, and blue channels are actually being delivered at different times. That is why if you were to actually, you know, wave your hand really quickly in front of a DLP projector, you will see a very interesting multicolored shadow. This happens because, well, your hand is moving very quickly, and it's actually shadowing the red, green, and blue channels at different points in time. So you end up seeing shadows that are cast by the different channels. The third display technology we'll be looking at today is LCD, or Liquid Crystal Display. Now, unfortunately, to explain how this works, we need to go into a little bit of physics, so do bear with me. We're gonna actually try to understand the concept of polarization. Okay, so here's the deal. Light is actually an electromagnetic wave. What this means is it's actually an electric field and a magnetic field oscillating at right angles. However, for the purpose of this explanation, just imagine it to be a single wave. We're gonna be talking about the direction of the wave, and that actually comes from the direction of the electric field. So yeah, for the sake of simplicity, let's just imagine it is one wave. As mentioned, this wave, when it's propagating forward, can actually be oriented in any direction. For most light sources, what you actually get is light coming out in all different polarizations. However, what we can do is we can use a polarizing filter to filter out waves with certain polarizations. This actually leads to an interesting effect, which directly contributes to how an LCD actually works. Here's the deal. Let's say we hold up a polarizing filter to a source of light. Let's just say that the direction of this filter is vertical. What this means is we filter out all directions of waves, except those in a vertical direction. Then we introduce another polarizing filter, except this one is oriented in the horizontal direction. Because of its orientation, it blocks out any light that is vertically polarized. At the same time, since it has no horizontally polarized light to work with, we end up with no light at all. By just holding up these two polarizing filters at perpendicular directions to each other, we actually end up blocking out all light. However, more interestingly, if we were to actually rotate the front polarizer slowly until it lines up with the polarizer at the back, we are actually allowing more and more light to come through. And that is in fact how we use polarizers to control light intensity. With this in mind, we can actually appreciate how LCD actually works. First, we start off with two perpendicular polarizing filters. So just like what we've explained earlier, this means that normally, light passing through is completely blocked. Then comes the star of the show, our liquid crystal. We stick a little bit of it in between the two layers of polarizing filters, and this actually creates a very interesting effect. Back in the day, the type of liquid crystal used is called Twisted Pneumatic, or TN for short. The idea is, this crystal has a twisted structure, and as a result, actually rotates the polarization of the light such that the polarization actually becomes correct for the front panel, and as a result, light goes right through. However, when we actually apply a current to the crystal, it actually untwists, and as a result, it no longer rotates the light such that it can pass through the front polarizer, and as such, the area appears dark. That is in fact how a liquid crystal display works. By applying current to selected areas of liquid crystal, what we end up doing is we end up blocking out some amount of light, and as a result, we can use that to draw an image. So what's special about LCDs is that they actually cannot generate light. All they do is manipulate existing light. That is why for simpler devices like, say, calculators, we have an LCD screen, and behind it, we actually have a reflective panel. This panel is able to, you know, collect light from the surroundings and bounce it back out. The LCD panel then actually, you know, selectively blocks out some area of the light thus acting as a display. For more complex displays, you know, in cases where we actually want a display to be emissive, what we'll have to do is to actually install a backlight behind the screen itself. 
That is in fact how a lot of the monitors these days actually work. Of course, a combination of these two can be used as well, and one very common example of this is in digital watches. Most of the time, you can actually read you know, the time of a watch because of the reflective screen at the back. However, if you're in the dark, press a button and a backlight comes on. So yeah, that's your combination of the two technologies. You may also have heard of the term IPS used in conjunction with you know, LCD screens. IPS is just a different approach in actually building the liquid crystal parts of the screen. It is in fact just an alternative to the twisted pneumatic liquid crystals. Because of the way it actually you know, positions some of its innards, what we end up with is a better viewing angle as well as better color reproduction. We move on once again to LED. Now, LED stands for light emitting diodes and is in fact, well, some way to generate light using a semiconductor. Now, unfortunately, it is going to be quite difficult to explain how an LED actually works. What we are about to see is extremely simplified. If you are interested to find out more, I highly encourage you do go and actually read up on this subject because there's a lot more of this than meets the eye. So here's the deal, everything is made up of atoms, atoms have a nucleus at the center which is positive, and there are a bunch of electrons actually orbiting the outside, these electrons are negative, and they sort of cancel out or balance out the positive charge from the nucleus. And so for the vast majority of atoms you find in the real world, there is this equilibrium and therefore everything is good. In a semiconductor however, we can actually sort of disturb this equilibrium. This allows us to create what is known as p-type and n-type semiconductors. You can imagine a p-type semiconductor as positive because some of the electrons have been removed. On the other hand, an n-type can be considered negative because more electrons have actually been added to that. For an LED, what we do is we actually stick a p-type and n-type semiconductor right next to each other creating what is known as a PN junction. When you actually apply a current to a PN junction, you are sort of pushing the excess electrons on the N side towards the P side. And this is where, well, your semiconductor becomes a conductor. As a side effect of this happening, light generation actually happens. The reason for this, put extremely simply, is that when electrons are on the N side, they actually have a higher energy level. When they actually scoot over to the P side and fall into one of the holes, they end up existing at a lower energy level. That difference in energy needs to go somewhere, and in fact, it manifests itself as a packet of light. That is essentially how an LED works, in extremely simplified terms. Now, in conjunction with LEDs, you may have heard of the term OLED, and what that simply means is, well, organic LEDs. The thing, the material that's actually creating the electroluminescence effect is in fact organic in nature, and that could refer to either some kind of molecule or some kind of long polymer. What's special about LEDs is that, well, they can generate their own light, and what this means is, they can not only be used as a display, you know, something that you actually look at, but they can also be used as a light source. In fact, the term LED panel can both refer to a screen or an actual light source itself. And thanks to the versatility of LEDs, well, you can actually create light sources that you can manipulate. LED lights can be manipulated to show different colors, different intensities, and if you were to actually hook them up to a microcontroller, you can even sort of set them up to do some cool light shows. Let's move on to our last item for the day, e-paper. Now, this one is very cool in the sense that it actually mimics the behavior of, well, just a sheet of paper. Most e-paper technologies actually work with physical colored pigments. And basically what happens is, well, there are some black and white pigments, they are charged differently, and basically in order to toggle the color of an individual pixel, you apply an electric field on that pixel itself. This causes the pigments to either move or reorientate based on their charges, and as such, change the color of the actual pixel itself. What's really special about many e-paper implementations is that it requires zero power, except when the state is being toggled. 
The reason for this is, well, once a state is actually changed, it is locked in. You don't actually require any more power for it to stay in that state. You can of course imagine that that is not true for many other, you know, different display technologies, say LCD. You have to constantly power a pixel of LCD so that, you know, the crystal actually stays untwisted. Another strong point of e-paper is that it is highly readable under any lighting conditions. The reason for this is because, well, in order to show intensity, we're just using pigments, which behave like, well, pigments on paper. And that's it. These are some of the more common display technologies that you expect to see these days. This is of course not an exhaustive list. Each one of these technologies branch out a lot more and they have their own variants. But hopefully today, what I've done is I've given you a broad overview of what there is out there. So yeah, that's it. I hope you've gained some insight today, but that's all there is for this particular episode. Thank you very much for watching and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.